Today we're going to talk about container technology and some of the really interesting things that have been happening there. So from the first computers, we had to figure out a way to share things, share them between multiple people and multiple apps with everybody getting what they needed because they were too expensive to have just one or have it do just one thing. So what do we need to share? Typically resources, CPU, memory, disk, space, disk I.O., security and privacy. We need to make sure that uh, if we're sharing a computer that we're not sharing too much. And dependencies, we need to make sure that you can have the dependencies you need for your app installed and I can have the dependencies I need for my app installed and that both apps can still run. So there's lots of ways to do this, um, mostly on the resource limitation side, but um, all the way from an unrestricted, totally basic system to the uh, limited things that have been in Unix for a long time with U limits and Cherooting. Then there's process control groups, which we're going to talk about a bit in a thin container, which we'll talk about as well, what I'm calling a fat container, and then what we're mostly familiar with is a VM, and then finally on the extreme end, that's an emulated one. So if you have to emulate a computer to share it, then you're not just, you're not able to run the CPU natively at all, you're actually simulating um, another type of CPU or even the same type of CPU on the same systems. So as we go from this left to right process, uh, U limits, process control groups, unrestricted systems don't impact your performance very much, but as you go further and further to the right, you see that your CPU and memory overhead start to go up, your latency starts to go up, image sizes go up, boot times go up, uh, and your density starts to go down pretty significantly. So one thing is that most of what we think of as the cloud, at least the infrastructure as a service, like the EC2s or the Rackspace cloud, um, these tend to be run on VM, whether it's Zen or KVM or a VMware solution. We're running full servers emulated in a virtual machine. Uh, at Media Temple, for many, many years, we've been running what I'm calling a fat container. Um, we've been using a, a product called Virtuoso, and there's an open source version of it called OpenVZ. Um, these are fat containers or thick containers, and what I mean by that is they still they aren't a VM, they're actually running in the same kernel, but there are um, controls in the kernel to make it look like when you're inside one of those containers, that that container is in itself a whole server. Um, it's a fat container because it actually is managing all the daemons, it's possibly running a different operating system, it's an entire miniature server, but it's in a container rather than in a virtual machine. So this is just a, a bit of an aside to say, the fact that density goes down as we go from left to right on that curve, density should be really important to us, especially in 2013. Um, first, profit, you know, everyone's trying to do more with less. Uh, if your density is low, it takes extra servers, it takes extra networking gear, your power costs are higher, uh, it, and that's a big deal for us. I mean, the mantra used to be computers are cheap, throw more at them, but that's more and more not true. You see blogs from startups all the time about how they move from EC2 to a couple of machines in their data center and drastically cut their bills, and it's becoming more of a, of a prevalent meme out there on the internet. I mean, idea meme, not cat picture meme. Um, performance is also very important to profit because uh, more and more what we're seeing uh, on the internet is people talking about how important performance is to their users, and, and we're starting to talk about uh, more and more often the milliseconds that it takes to do something as being something that's really important to us, especially with these apps that have lots of round trips. And finally, there's the social and environmental responsibility. Um, power usage takes carbon dioxide, even buying an extra server and shipping it to you uh, can generate extra carbon dioxide. Uh, manufacturing, there's a typo on that slide, I thought I fixed that, but um, manufacturing has a lot of negative uh, waste side effects and it uses non-renewable precious metal resources and as we know from the uh, nets strung around the Foxconn facility uh, a lot of computer and high-tech manufacturing are pretty bad from a working condition perspective so the short version is if we can take one server and do the job of five servers then that's probably something we should really pay attention to across all these different axes uh, power is still a huge huge issue um, I haven't linked to Slashdot in a long time, but this article came up and uh, was very relevant, which is a study that found that a huge amount of the data centers are powered still by polluting coal. And yes, they're scrubbing coal these days and it's not as bad as it used to be, but it's still uh, a big problem. 
data centers use a huge percentage of the total power of the US and of the world, and uh, a lot of that power is non-renewable and polluting. So the way we do cloud with these VMs I'm going to show you uh, is not the most efficient way and that there are some better ways that we should probably start looking at things because today is a bit fat. Okay, a digression. Let's look at the app and server layer. So how do we ship our applications today? Uh, if you read my blog, or you're reading this on my blog now, you'll know that I'm very passionate about uh, distribution packages. So um, this is just a screenshot of a blog post that I wrote about it um, a few years ago. But at Media Temple, we have a pretty hard and fast rule that if you're going to ship a bit to a computer, it's done. The only way you can change a bit on a computer is if it's installed by a package or it's configured by configuration management. And if it's something that should be packaged, it should be packaged. So we have a lot of infrastructure around automatically building packages and helping make it that simple. But there are lots of reasons that when I ship software to pack to, to computers, I would really, really want that to be in packages. However, uh, sometimes that dogma, while it's very useful for running servers for a long time, can be very painful to work with. So um, let's say, in, a new developer puts together a Python app and we're trying to package it. Oh, it needs Python 3.2, but the distro that we're working with doesn't have that. Um, okay, well, now we need a library that clashes with the systems version as well, which sucks because it needs to be the Python 3.2 version. Okay, so we can use virtual env and Python brew and we can glue it all together and we actually know we figured out how to ship that app. It, oh. Uh, it's not just the Python now. Uh, we need a newer version of Redis because it needs Lua support. The distro has 2.4, but we want to run 2.6. And the QA team, they're standardizing on CentOS, so uh, it's not, I mean, I know in Prague we're running Ubuntu, but we're trying to get on CentOS, so could you guys just make both packages? Oh, and uh, this is a Node app that we want to run as a search service under slash search. That's cool, right? Um, so I don't know how many of us have had those sorts of conversations, but they're very real conversations, and to effectively package all of those things can be a huge pain. And even once you've packaged them, uh, it's not all sunshine and rainbows because if there's a new, let's say, OpenSSL package out, okay, can I push it? Which of the apps that we've nicely packaged uh, that are running on this system can actually use it? Which apps are gonna break? And if one of those apps gets exploited, we still haven't really solved our uh, a lot of our containment problems that we talked about um, being one of our goals for sharing systems effectively. So uh, I don't know if they were the first to do it, but they were the ones I heard about doing it first. Netflix figured out uh, that, okay, if we don't worry about configuring the system per se and packaging our software, but we just make the package be a VM image, the entire system, then that's something that we can test as a unit. We can push it out as a unit and deploy it. We can roll it back if something goes horribly wrong. And that's progress. That's actually a pretty sane, interesting way of working. Um, but one problem with that is that a whole computer is a very chunky unit of abstraction. Um, you're still dealing with lots of problems that for pushing apps you might not want to be solving. There's a lot of system and surface area. You still have to manage users. You still have to make sure that the other packages that you're not managing are up to date and working well. You have to deal with other daemons that maybe you didn't necessarily want to be running um, or making sure that they're not running. You have to jog. Um, you're juggling really large images, so even if you make a one byte change to your software, if the way you're deploying your software is actually uh, a VM, then that's a half gigabyte image or more that you're pushing uh, just to deal with a one byte change. And you can probably use rsync and some other tools, but um, that's something that you have to solve. Also, the boot times aren't great, so I looked around to see kind of what the world record for a KVM boot time was, and I saw some people get really excited about a regular type system booting in two seconds, but also it can take up to 15 minutes. OpenStack has a whole project that I heard Monty Taylor talk about at uh, the All Things Open conference where I first gave this talk, um, and he was saying it's called Node Pool, and it's effectively just there to keep a bunch of VMs spun up so that when they want one for running their amazing uh, continuous integration process uh, and testing stuff, that they don't have to wait 15 minutes to get a VM. And briefly, we alluded to this before, but the density of, on a VM isn't great. If you've got 80 VMs running on a host, you're doing pretty well, uh, and those VMs might not be doing that well. So 
Uh, just a simple example, you know, what's the most efficient commuter car? The VM is kind of the Hummer. You can kind of do anything with it. If you need to go up a hill, you can go up a hill. But if all you're doing is commuting back and forth on a crowded freeway, then something that's sipping fuel is probably better. Okay, VMs, they're totally doable, but they're probably a little heavy. So what about PaaS? I do like PaaS a lot, and I think there's a rich feature in PaaS, partly powered by some of the container technology that's emerging right now. Um, so Heroku kind of popularized the slug about uh, we do process virtualization, not ser server virtualization. I think they called it virtualization. Um, that's the way I remember it anyway. Um, sort of. So it, there's some struggles there as well. I mean, uh, if you want to do everything on a PaaS, depending on which PaaS you're using, you can do that. Um, that's great. It's really easy. You don't have to have anything. But if you do, for whatever reason, regulatory or efficiency, or um, you have certain things that don't fit that model, if you want to be doing local versions of that, offline versions of that, it can be tough to still make it work. There's a hard upper bound on troubleshooting. There's been uh, some famous issues recently where people running on PaaS had very difficult uh, problems with troubleshooting load balancing and, and other unusual things that weren't working super well. Uh, and yeah, it, you can kind of get at what you can get at and you can't get at what you can't get at. Sometimes you're gonna be shipping to a fixed user land. So let's say uh, the PaaS is kind of ultimately backed by Ubuntu and you've got this package that you pull from a vendor that's running on CentOS. A, you might not be able to install it and B, uh, you might not even be allowed to install packages at all. And, and there are lots of capability limits if you need certain kinds of daemons or storage. So it's it's a way to install apps and if what you're doing uh, to, to deploy and manage apps and if what you're doing fits into that pass, then it can be really fantastic, but it's not perfect. So I'm asking you to dream with me here. What I would really love is to take everything from the kind of VM or fat container side, drop all those extra virtualization layers because when you're running a VM, you're actually running multiple kernels, you're running uh, all kinds of additional uh, processes and virtualization layers and networking stacks and all kinds of extra stuff, depending on the actual VM technology that can vary case by case, but almost always there's some kind of extra stuff. Um, so let's lose as much of that as possible. Let's run as close as we can to the native box um, and drop all the daemons that we don't care about and drop the large image sizes. But we do want to keep some things that VMs bring to the party, like resource controls, accounting, a customizable user land, so that yes, we can install whatever weird package or run in whatever weird distro we need to. Network management stuff, so you know, be able to do interesting routing and firewalling and stuff from within our container, and and local ownership, so that if I want to run something on my network, I can totally run it on my network as well as push it out and run it on some cloud service or run it on bare metal at a colo somewhere. So the project that kind of perfectly fits this is a really fascinating new uh, release from a company which is now actually, as I record this, called Docker. It used to be called Dot .cloud um, and it, their, their project is called Docker. It's fantastic. So what is Docker? Docker is an open source project to easily create lightweight, portable, self-sufficient containers from any application. So I wanted to emphasize a few things. Um, it's open source, which is cool, even though it's uh, made by a commercial company, but it's got tons and tons of contributions from outside the company. Um, lightweight, it's about as lightweight as you can possibly get, other than maybe some new approaches like zero VM, but for all intents and purposes, they are extremely lightweight. Uh, it's portable, and that's a really important aspect, which is if I run a Docker container on my local machine, then that exact same container can run on any other machine that's capable of running Docker. It's self-sufficient, so each container has everything that it requires. There's no um, nothing necessary to have installed outside the container other than just Docker and the basic things that Docker are required uh, requires. And application is an important keyword there. So the whole design of Docker is about packaging applications, not packaging VMs, not packaging machines, not packaging servers. It's, it's very application centric. So from a kind of architecture level, Docker is written in Go. Uh, it's the first major project that I've actually used that's written in Go, um, which is pretty exciting because Go's designed for these sorts of tasks in large part. Um, 
it encapsulates some other uh, services. There's AUFS, which is a um, copy on write file system, which we will talk about in a bit. And there are now some more file system options coming, coming out. Um, and it drives LXE, the Linux containers project. Um, and LXE is, its, is in and of itself a bit of a wrapper around C groups, which is that um, process groups originally submitted by Google back in about 2006, um, and namespaces, which is something that's a feature of the kernel. Almost every process, if not every process, that your com computer, your Linux machine is actually running is already in a namespace. Uh, namespaces are, are a feature that are, are starting to become used more and are pretty fantastic. And we'll see a bit about how all these things work. So another way to look at it is that um, Docker sits in the middle, drives LXC, and then there are sort of three orthogonal areas which have totally separate concerns. There's AUFS, which is responsible for the file system. And again, we'll see in a minute that there are other options coming soon. Um, and then there's cgroups, which are responsible for taking the processes that are running in your container and grouping them and uh, managing their resources, doing accounting, things like that. And then there's namespaces, which is responsible, which are responsible for um, the making your process feel like it's in its own unique little environment um, by creating the sort of faux server layer. We'll see examples of all of that. Uh, I originally gave this talk, as I said, at the All Things Open conference, which was in Raleigh, North Carolina, about two blocks away from Red Hat's office. Um, so I gave them extra special thanks in this slide, but I'm still thankful to them. Um, they have been in as part of their OpenShift PaaS. They were originally doing something like containers in a custom way called Gears, um, and they announced a few months ago that they were switching over to Docker because there was a lot of duplication there. One issue with AUFS as Docker's file system layer is that it's not in the mainline kernel, and uh, so to run it, you need to be running a Debian or Ubuntu uh, distro, and um, Red Hat obviously it's didn't want to include AUFS, but wanted to make Docker work. So they've contributed support for Device Mapper, which I don't know if has landed yet, but it seems like it's coming soon, if not already here. I don't know when you're watching this, so it could have been here years ago. Um, but the, uh, yes, so that's very cool because it means that Docker will be able to run on many, many, many different um, op operating systems, probably almost any Linux, and they're working to make it work on anything that's got a stock kernel. Um, the other interesting news is, uh, I really wish I remember how I was gonna finish that sentence, but we'll all have to just bear with it and move on. Um, Docker containers are extremely lightweight. They're effectively as lightweight as running the processes natively. You can build containers manually or with all kinds of repeatable build processes. So if you're using Puppet or Chef or um, you've got some build script or you're using Fabric, there are ways to make that work with Docker. Um, and so it's more of a porting process if you've already got a build process running. But uh, if you want to automate it using your normal tools, that's generally going to be doable. And you can take these containers that you build and you can run them on the local machine if it's Linux. Um, or I run it Vagrant in Vagrant on a Mac, uh, in dev, in QA, in staging, in prod, um, on many of the clouds, on a PaaS, you can run it on bare metal. Um, you can take this container and ship it all over the place. So who is Docker? Well, it's lots of people. Um, open source by .cloud. These slides are written just before the name change. Um, .cloud slash Docker as a company has released a lot of other great open source tools. One of my favorites is Apache, which actually works well with Docker. Um, Apache is a uh, node-based web load balancer, um, which is powered by Redis on the back end, so that uh, as you add and remove new back end servers, potentially containers built on Docker, you can just uh, tweak a Redis set and do it uh, on the fly, which is fantastic without having to rebuild an Nginx config and restart it or uh, some of the other ways you've traditionally solved that problem. It's less than a year old, but it's hundreds of committers. And uh, I, my feed reader is, uh, I didn't go looking for people talking about Docker, but my feed reader is largely full of people talking about Docker. So uh, it's a very popular uh, thing to talk about. And here I am 
adding to the noise. Uh, at the time, I did a quick survey. Out of about 40-something people in the room, uh, eight had heard of Docker and four had played with it. One of them was actually an OpenShift contributor, so that was cheating. Um, but yeah, so not, not everyone has heard of it, but a lot of people have heard of it. So Docker uses some terms in a very specific way that it took me a little bit to wrap my brain about. So um, I thought I would try to show those visually and help make them understandable. So uh, Docker talks about an image. So an image is an actual uh, snapshot point in time of your container's file system. Uh, but it's a version of it that's saved to disk. And images can be stacked and chained together. So if you pull down from Docker the base Ubuntu image, um, then someone can deploy an Nginx image, which says that it depends on the base Ubuntu image. And so you'll actually download two files, or actually sometimes more, uh, which contain those images, and they depend on each other. So, uh, but the Nginx layer of it is effectively just a delta on the base image, so it can be very, very small, which is one of the nice things that makes these containers quite lightweight. Um, when you take a image and you say Docker run with that image name, it starts a container. So a container is an image brought to life. And as soon as you bring an image to life in the form of a container, uh, it gets its own file system, its own disk. And uh, once a container is running, you can manage containers with Docker PS. So you can do uh, Docker start, Docker stop to start and stop containers that already exist and do Docker, P Docker PS. PS-A will show you containers that aren't currently running. By default, it just shows you the running containers. Um, so if you've got a running container and you want to take that container's disk and turn it back into an image, you can certainly do that. Um, and the tool to do that is Docker commit. Um, so Docker run takes an image and turns it into a container. Docker commit takes a container and turns it into an image. Docker start and Docker stop, start and stop containers uh, that were already running. Uh, so what you can see you can do with this is that if we had our own tweaks that we wanted to do to some Nginx image, which in and of itself was based on an Ubuntu image, we could make those changes and commit it, give it a name, and then if we wanted to start new containers based off that image, we could totally do that. Um, Docker also has this upstream capability called uh, the Docker index, and you can actually run a Docker container off the Docker index to run your own Docker index. Um, so it's just a, a bit of software, and you can get an account there, and that's why you see under app image, a lot of the image names will be some username slash some name that they choose uh, in the kind of GitHub inspired style. So um, if you've got images on your machine, you can say Docker push and push an image or a new version of an image, um, and Docker pull will get new images for you to start building containers from. We'll see an example of that later. Um, as of, I think, 0.6, if not 0.5, um, Docker now requires you to run most of the commands as root. So um, I just put in a sudo Docker there for you to get, start getting used to that idea. Um, ideally, you're not just sitting in a root shell all the time, but some of us can get lazy from time to time. Um, so the basic commands, Docker PS, list the containers. Uh, if you do a PS-A, as I said, it'll show you the containers that aren't running currently. Docker images, we actually talked through most of these. Docker build, we'll see some examples of how to build a container, um, sorry, build an image from a Docker file. Uh, see, I keep, uh, still still mess that up sometimes. Um, Docker in inspect will tell you a lot about an image, and then uh, there's Docker logs to see what an image has been, uh, a running container has been talking about. There's a bunch of other commands, but those are the ones that I tended to use the most. Um, so why is Docker awesome? Density. Um, First, you've got this incredible native density out of the box. Uh, it's almost the same, I mean, just basically the same as just running processes on an unvirtualized, uncontainerized Linux machine. Uh, in fact, they start so fast that if you're doing a workload that requires um, that, uh, sorry, if you, if you have a workload that doesn't need to have a process actually running, you can eat the time of a process just starting up, then you can leave the container shut down and just either create the containers or start the containers as needed. 
Uh, it's got this, you can limit a lot of different variables. Unfortunately, not uh, NFS IO yet, but you can limit RAM, CPU, block IO, um, and uh, network IO, actually through IP tables. Uh, you've got these private and public Docker repos, which are useful. Um, the fact that you can stack these images together means that we can ship our own base image out and do base image updates there. But most of the time when we're just shipping deltas to our app, if it's a one byte change, then only the file that changed uh, will actually have to go across the wire. It's got this incredible consistency at every stage. So if I've got it working in QA, then it's going to work in prod almost 100% of the time. And it's really the minimum viable moving parts um, that you can uh, that you can have to actually ship an application that has all of these capabilities uh, that we're looking for. It's basically taking the capabilities built into Linux itself at this point and just wrapping that around something and making it feel like it's in its own private environment without anything extraneous. Uh, I found this quote on a blog post that. Uh, somebody had written, uh, this guy added a comment, I don't know who he is, but the comment struck me as being really interesting because I'd been focused on the kind of density side, but because it is so much simpler, the reliability goes up and that's almost as important. This guy said that uh, when they switched their test runs that, yeah, the speed has gone way up, but also the tests almost never fail. So we do have a large test infrastructure that's built around uh, KVM, and when you spin up by, uh, via OpenStack at this point as well. And um, there are definitely cases when you go to spin up a VM, if you're doing it over and over and over thousands of times a day, uh, that it doesn't work. Um, so, and it turn, there's lots of weird things that can go wrong because starting an entire virtual server through an interesting fabric like OpenStack, there are things that can break. So let's get our hands dirty. Uh, let's get the command line cracked open and see what Docker actually looks like. Uh, I should note that Docker, is, the command line tool is actually interfacing with a REST API. So anything you see here, you can actually do over a REST API talking to the Docker daemon directly, which is super cool when you think about uh, things like you integrating with Apache to um, build very, very simple PaaS-like systems. So if we type Docker PS on a, on a new Vagrant clean VM, nothing's running, okay? Uh, so Docker run, we remember that the way to get from an image to a running container is to run Docker run. So uh, we're saying base it off the Ubuntu 12.10 tag and run the process bash. Okay, so there we are, we're running a process bash. Uh, we, the dash I flag says we want it to be interactive, so we're, we're sitting at the shell. Um, and run an app get update. Unfortunately, the syntax highlighting on the slide, it thinks this is Ruby code, so uh, the colors are a little weird. Anything that happens after a root shell looks like a comment, but so be it. We can, we can deal, right guys? Okay, I mean, people, let's be inclusive. Okay, so app get update, app get install, and exit. Okay, so if I do Docker PS, I wouldn't actually see anything because we created a new container, but we didn't leave it running. You can see over on the right under the status that it said status created 56 seconds ago and it's exited. But we do have this new container. One thing you'll notice over on the left is the ID. If you're familiar with working with Git, uh, everything in Docker has a SHA, a big, long, gnarly, hexadecimally hash that you can um, use to identify things. So images have SHAs, containers have SHAs, uh, everything has a SHA. Okay, uh, so if I use that SHA, then I can actually refer to that container. So I'm going to take that container that we talked about and turn it into an image using Docker commit. So I can put a commit message actually, just like with Git. I'm gonna say, okay, commit this container and give it the ID. And what we get back is another ID, you can see. So I took an Im I took a ID of a container and I said, commit it, turn it into an image. And what I got back was the ID of an image. And so if you look down at the final line there, uh, the fact that I gave it a name jbarrett slash redis01 uh, with the dash t flag has been cut off here, but you can see it uh, in the source, I guess. Um, but yes, I told it to create a new image. It created an image 517800, and you can see that there it is. If I do Docker images, there's image 517800. And again, if you do Docker PS, 
no prop, no containers are running because we made an image and not a container. And just a reminder on that slide. So uh, hopefully that's clear to you at this point. Okay, so let's say I wanted to run that image, um, but uh, I want it to be daemonized. I throw in the dash D flag. And I'm also throwing in the dash P flag, which says forward the port 6379, which is the standard Redis port from inside the container. I want you to forward it outside the container. So if I do that, um, I get my SHA back. Here's the, here's the SHA of the container, which I think is a different SHA than the original container, right? Yes, the original container was 7F407. I've created a new container here, 822EA69, etc. cetera. Um, and if you do Docker PS, you'll see that there are, the port on the local server, 49153, is being forwarded to port 6379. And the command that's running is Redis server, and there we go. So if I tell it into my local IP port 49153, then you can see that I'm talking to a functioning Redis server. Uh, I didn't realize you could talk to a Redis server over Telnet, so that's kind of exciting until I tried it. Um, and if you Docker attach or Docker logs, um, you will get to watch. Docker attach will show you the streaming standard out. Um, and you can see the Redis server is chatting away about the connections it has and how much space it's using. So if on the host machine, I just do a PS and uh, throw in the F flag so you can see the, the forest, you'll see what's running is there's um, shell is running Docker daemon, which is running a Docker daemon. Docker daemon has run an LXC start command. And you can see that 822EA, I've uh, chopped it off so you can see uh, the rest of what's going on, that it it's actually running LSC and LXC and telling LXC to start a container, and that it's calling it with the dash F flag to tell it where on the file system to get the files. And that LXC container has launched as a child process the Redis server. And notice that the process ID for that is 3120. That'll come in handy in a second. Um, so that's what one one of the things that's cool, and when I say these are very thin containers, is as far as my container goes, other than the LXC process starting it, there's only the one process running. This is not a whole server. This is just the Redis server process that's running. And if I use the LXC attach command, uh, I can actually connect into that container and and run a process inside that that process space. So if I run a PS inside the container, you can see that the PID is not three one two zero it's PID1. And so let's see why that's possible. That's because that's the kernel namespace feature. So there are a bunch of different namespaces in the kernel and they control and manage different things. Um, so there's the process namespace, the PID namespace. And that means if you create a new namespace, then every process inside that namespace, uh, sorry, inside that namespace, all the process IDs, they can be completely unique and you can repeat process IDs from the parent system um, in the native native layer of the system. Um, so yeah, you can run, and the same thing for networking, you can have your own IP tables rules. Same thing for IPC, you can have your own uh, shared memory segments and uh, IPC stuff. Uh, there's same thing for the mount, you can have your own file systems mounted inside a container that aren't mounted in the host machine. And you can set your own host name, actually. If you see uh, root at 822EA, if I type the hostname command, that's actually what comes back. So um, each container has its own little fake hostname set. And the one new thing in uh, namespaces that I don't believe is actually in Docker yet, but is coming soon, is um, the user namespace, which means that you can manage all of these namespaces with uh, unprivileged levels of access. So you can, in fact, run uh, Docker as an unprivileged user, which is even better for security because at the moment, most of the time you're running Docker as root. So the other thing that's cool is this uh, unioning file system. So you saw when we called LXC a few slides back that it uh, it gave it the dash F var lib docker dot dot dot. It got uh, ellipsed there. Um, well, what's in var lib docker is actually one of the things Docker manages with the unioning file system. There's a directory called containers, which has all of the SHAs of the container. You can see that most of the time when we see these SHAs, we're seeing just a very short version of it, that the entire SHA is a bit on the massive side. Um, 
So if I look inside that container, our W directory, which is the read write chunk, all I see is one file called dump.rdb. Now dump.rdb is the file that um, Redis creates. So uh, we're looking at Redis's actual database that it saved because we tell them that it in and made some changes. And that's all. That's the only file. And again, this is this is how these are thin. The only process running is the Redis process, and the only file in this container is the file that Redis saved. If I do a Docker diff, then um, you can you don't have to do this trick where you find the SHA with the ugly directory. Docker diff will show you in this nice subversion style that shows you a file was added that there's a dump.rdb file. Now, if I connect to that container and go mess around and create some files and directories, then you can also see that those other files and directories got created. And Docker manages the linkages that say this union file system is running off this container, which is running, sorry, this container is backed by this union file system, which is parented off this other one, which is parented off this other one. Uh, you can actually get a graph like this anytime you want to by running Docker images dash viz, which is uh, something created by my friend and fellow Media Temple employee, Nate Jones. Um, so we do have a patch in Docker. Um, you can decide how um, critical this feature is, but it's still pretty cool to be able to see how they all work together. So the other thing that you're seeing in our Docker container are C groups. So if I go into SysFS C group, then you can actually drill down into these different um, C group uh, capabilities, I think they're called. Um, so there's the CPU one and memory, and there's a bunch of other ones here. I've just showed a few for uh, for examples, but they create an LXC subdirectory, and each con running container has its own C group um, ID in there. So once you know what that SHA is, you can see exactly, uh, you can actually check out all the variables inside it. So um, you can see here if I cat the CPU account dot usage multiple times that that number is going up. So that's the, the total number of jiffies, that's a, a counter, so that's, so that's great, I can track that. Um, so if you are doing any kind of billing based around this, or you want to know internally how, how much CPU each of your Docker containers is taking, then you can just toss that into Collect D or Graphite or something and, and keep track of it. Um, you can also track the memory usage, and you can see at the bottom that you can set limits to these things as well. So you can set the memory limit in bytes. By default, Docker doesn't set it, but if you just pass it the dash M flag, when you create a container, it will set that. So it's fast. I have said it's fast. Now I will show you that it's fast. So if I do a Docker stop on a container, and it's, by the way, it works the same as Git, where if you type um, any bit of the SHA that uniquely matches that container, it will work. So even though the SHA is uh, half a mile long. If you just type the first four characters, then that's generally going to be enough. Um, so if I stop that Docker container and then I start it, you can see it starts in real time 0.15 seconds. Now, on a real machine, this is running on a Vagrant VM on a MacBook Air. So on a real machine, Docker start might actually be effectively much faster than that, and time is not the most reliable way. But it's a good order of magnitude kind of sense for how it's going to look. But 150 milliseconds is pretty snappy. In fact, if on the native system I do service read as service start, um, and this might be extra latency coming from upstart, or it might just be uh, an unlucky moment on the hard drive, but it actually takes longer to start a native Redis server service than it does to start an entire Docker container which contains a Redis, ser Redis server. And even more startling, uh, if I say create a brand new container from scratch, based off our Redis image and run Redis server, that actually takes even less time. Uh, I ran it about 10 times uh, for all of these commands, and um, sometimes Docker start of an existing container was slightly faster than Docker from, but they take they all take about the same amount of time. They're about as fast as each other. So it's as fast to start a new container and start a service as it is to start an existing container and start a service as it is to start the service native on the machine. Okay, so the way I built that Redis container is not very repeatable. Um, and yes, the DevOps gods are angry because we we want repeatable, automated, deployable builds. Uh, readmes don't cut it anymore. <clears throat> uh, if it's not executable by a computer, it doesn't count as documentation. I believe all of that very strongly. So uh, let me show you how you can automate that. 
Docker has this great built-in capability called a Docker file. Uh, so you can, it's a very simple syntax. It's kind of a starting word with some keywords after it. So uh, we're saying that we're basing this off the Ubuntu 12.10, and then each one of those run commands actually runs a command inside the container and then commits the result and then runs the next command inside a container and commits the result. So we're saying, okay, take a container and run app get update. And that's not super necessary if you don't, uh, if you know that your stuff's all up to date, but uh, it, since we're only gonna do this to build the container, then it's not a bad idea. Uh, we're gonna app get install the Reddit server. And then that thing we had to do where we passed the port on the command line, you can add a uh, little slug to the Docker file to say, okay, expose port 6379. You can actually put uh, a, a port on, if you put port colon port, you can choose the port that it'll use on your local machine as well. Um, otherwise it just randomly assigns one as we've seen. And then the final one is command, which tells you when you launch this Docker file, what command should we automatically when you launch a container based off this image that we're going to build what command should it run by default um, so then as we mentioned docker build will take a docker file and turn it into a container so uh, what's cool is that it'll show you every step that it's doing and how it's managing it so if you tweak your docker file or one of your upstream dependencies changes or something as much as possible it's going to use cached layers. So building the first Docker container can take a little bit of time, um, but if you make changes to your code and you run Docker build again, it's very, very fast. And if I say uh, run that then and do Docker PS, then you can see, sure enough, I have a brand new Docker container running my Docker file based uh, Reddit server. Another cool thing you can do is layer Docker files. So um, if we build a Redis image internally that we're using or we pull it off the Docker index, then I can create another Docker file, which is very simple, which just says add fixtures.sh to slash temp fixtures.sh and then run it. Um, and that will now generate me a new image. Uh, and this fixtures.sh, sorry, the idea here is let's say that you're doing a lot of tests with a database. Um, so <clears throat> historically, you might drop the tables in a MySQL database that you've started for testing purposes, load the schema, load your test data, and then run your tests, and that takes some time. So in this model, and has moving parts that can break, in this model you actually build a container which has a preloaded set of test, test data, save that as an image, um, and this is obviously very goofy test data that we're generating here, but you can imagine how useful that would be for uh, test automation, which is spin up the test data laden image. So sure enough, I'm going to build that. Um, I've built it. Everything's fine. Um, we've told Redis to exit. And so if I run that, it's going to create me a whole new container based off my Redis fixture tag. Um, and if I do Docker PS, I can see, yeah, that last Docker file based one I showed you is running, but so is this new one called Redis Fixture. And if I run Redis CLI this time, it's the Telnet just to mix it up uh, and connect to that port, then sure enough, that fixture data that I loaded is there. Even though I've just started this container from this brand new uh, image, it's a Redis that contains that data already. Um, a lot of the basic automation that you're gonna wanna do, you can actually script really easily with containers. So um, if, you've got a Docker, a common thing that I found when I started working with Docker is uh, I've got a Docker container running and I wanna rebuild it based on a Docker file, find the container that's running, stop that container and uh, start the one that I just built. So you can just do Docker PS and pull out the old container ID. Um, if it found it, then go ahead um, and docker build dash t with the tag that you gave it, <clears throat> docker stop the old container, and docker run dash d the new container. Um, uh, sorry, docker run dash d the tag. And so what you'll be left with is a running container, which is a whole new container built based on the new image, based on the tag of the, uh, the um, tag that you handed the script. So this is in the git repo if you want to play with it, but uh, it's 
not that cool of a script, but the coolest thing about it is Docker is really easy to automate like this. It's kind of designed from a command line bolting together. Now, if you look at the Doku project, it's actually a full blown PaaS, um, <clears throat> more or less built out with a hundred lines of bash scripting and Docker. So very cool. And Heroku build packs, which is a bit cheating, but uh, it's very, very cool. The doctor index is also cool. Apparently I overused that word. Um, but there are tons of packages people have pushed to Docker index, just like they pushed them to GitHub. If you feel nervous about downloading binaries off the internet, which I don't blame you, um, a lot of times something that's on the Docker index, you can get the Docker file yourself out of a GitHub repo or some other published repo and <clears throat> Docker build it yourself. But uh, you can also Docker pull. So I don't know, especially on a Mac, if you've ever tried to install IPython notebook. It's a very awesome, powerful tool, but the dependencies can be a bit of a pain even with homebrew. Um, so I was surprised, pleasantly surprised to note that I could just docker pull IPython notebook and run it and do docker ps and in no time at all I was running um, an IPython notebook out of a docker container on a local VM, which is pretty sweet. The ecosystem around docker is kind of mind-blowing. Um, it, the ecosystem around containers in general is also very mind-blowing. Um, everything from zero VM, which I mentioned, just learned about the other day, um, or straight ahead LXC. LXC is very capable on its own and people are building things with it. LXC is integrated into OpenStack, um, as is Docker. We'll look at that in a minute. Uh, there's Cloud Linux, there's, uh, which is a port of some of the stuff in OpenVZ to make it into a more lightweight container, a thin container versus a fat container. Um, there's a new project released by Google called Let Me Container That For You, which is pretty hilarious since the original uh, was Let Me Google That For You, but good game, guys. Um, which I believe also uses LXC and C groups, so it's a, um, it's a different approach to Docker. They're not necessarily competitive. You, I think you can probably possibly use both, but um, it's an interesting project and worth looking at, but people are using containers for a lot of different things. But Docker is crazy. Like there's a PaaS from Yandex, which is the Google of Russia called Cocaine, not joking around. They they knew what they were doing and everything. Um, dot cloud slash Docker has their PaaS. Um, DS is an open, there's an open DS. There's OpenShift, which is uh, the Red Hat service and open source project. There's something called Flynn, which is from uh, one of the co-creators of Docker. <clears throat> it's a PaaS. And there's Doku, which is actually by the same guy. It's that 100-line PaaS. In infrastructure-type projects, uh, you can actually use Docker in the latest release of uh, OpenStack called Havana, which just came out not that long ago. Um, on many VPS-type products, you can run Docker. Um, there's an entire distro which is just built to run Docker. So Core OS, it's basically just the minimalist kernel they could ship with what's needed to put Docker containers on it. You can use a bunch of the most popular config management tools to configure Docker containers and in some cases deploy them. There's orchestration like OpenStax Heat. Um, Maestro is a, is a standalone Docker orchestrating things and uh, these tools do things like uh, I've got a, I want to deploy WordPress, so that would be a MySQL container and a um, Apache set up with PHP in a container. <clears throat> and I need to deploy them at the same time and they need to know about each other so that I can connect from one to the other. So the orchestration frameworks let you do those sorts of things as well as upgrades and things like that. And there's a bunch of dashboards, so um, Docker UI and Shipyard and Horizon from OpenStack as well. So this is, I just wanted to show quickly what it looks like from OpenStack. Um, <clears throat> if you boot a container, then um, it, it's, you can see that it's, uh, it's running this off the Docker index. Um, you've, you've booted a M1 Tiny running with your own name, and there it is. It's showing you that it's building. If you do, do a Nova list, you can see Okay, normally when you do Nova List, you're seeing a bunch of VMs, but here you're seeing a Docker container happily running. And then Heat lets you do that example I was talking about with WordPress. So um, this is pretty new stuff, but um, with Heat, you can take 
you can see that they're running this template that shows how to do a WordPress and MySQL. He building a stack and then kicking it off and you can do a Docker PS and see that it's actually running Apache in one container with the WordPress doc and a MySQL doc and it's running start MySQL D and they both got their own ports forwarded to the right ports on the inside and off you go it works. Um, security is the big question that always seems to come up and it's the first one I had about this. Um, it seems like the LXC and um, AUFS and the other file system management and the namespaces, it's all very tested, very solid stuff. There was a well-known workaround in LXC um, where you could, it's because you are running as root and if you had access to the sys file system, you could, or proc, proc file system, you could send some weird stuff in um, and cause the box to reboot and possibly get root. Um, Ubuntu version has app armor deployed and you can't do at least those bad things, and I'm not aware of any other bad things that are still open. Um, the other approach that OpenShift is taking is something like uh, using SE Linux to sort of wrap it so that the things that you're not supposed to be allowed to do if you can't get out of the container, um, LXE tells you not to do, but also SE Linux tells you not to do it as well. So if either of them fails, they act as a failback for each other. Um, I did mention that you should be able to run Docker com containers as daemon users or low privilege users as well, which will help in addition because uh, there isn't any um, p potential to elevate that to root unless there's an actual kernel root exploit. Um, and then, yeah, as with all things security, you know, the Docker index is code that other people built, so be careful. Um, <clears throat> I I heard that the Docker project's actually working on it. I haven't seen this, uh, but a sort of um, signing mechanism so that you can confirm that a given Docker file is actually a thing that created a resulting Docker image, which should help with some of these things. So uh, from a sysadmin perspective, we're definitely breaking new ground here. Um, you know, right now on my network, I can have each box check its packages and um, let me know if there are updates available, if there are security updates available, and I can aggregate those all and pay attention. That's not quite doable yet. Um, we're going to have to figure out different ways to approach that problem in the Dockerverse. Um, also, the immediate feedback I got was, OK, now it's easier to deploy Node.js, but now we've just deployed Node.js, and our ops team doesn't know how to deal with that, and we're not on the Node security list, and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, if you lower the friction to deploy lots of different kinds of apps, uh, you still have to deal with the fact that now there are lots of different kinds of apps in your environment, and that might have security implications. Uh, it doesn't mean don't do it, it just means know what you're doing. It. Um, but the nice thing is there are less cases when this happens, because right now every server I've got deployed, I don't actually, you know, we start generally with a base OS install and install the packages we need to run the apps that we care about, so off the top of my head, I can't tell you uh, which machines actually depend on that open SSL that might be vulnerable. Um, in fact, we're not going to run any processes that we don't care about. Uh, so most Docker containers aren't going to be running SSHD, whereas most real servers will be. Um, and if an exploit does happen, unless it's you know co-located with a local root uh, type situation, then even if they crack your app, they've cracked an app that's in a very restrictive, small uh, container. And there are a lot, the, the one nice thing is there's lower friction to do upgrades. So in a sort of traditional system management style, if I've got a box that's running my SQL in Apache 2, I need to be a bit careful about upgrading my SQL because uh, it's, if it the upgrade doesn't work or whatever, now my whole stack is broken. Um, in the Docker world, I can, upgrade and test my SQL sort of in a decoupled way of upgrading and testing my web stack and, and um, be more confident about, about pushing them all out together and not worry about dependent libraries. If both my SQL and Apache depend on OpenSSL, then I can test that my SQL works with the new OpenSSL and then test that Apache works with the new OpenSSL and, and move on. And also, if you're actually building your Docker images off sort of a common base image, let's say, then you really only do need to check to make sure that the packages in the base image are up to date and when they require updates, 
that tells you what images you've deployed will need uh, to be upgraded. You can use that Docker viz um, Docker, Im Docker images management to find out um, which images now are effectively out of date because Docker Docker's kept that image. Um, again, caveats about running untrusted code off the internet, but if you are running this on an Ubuntu box or I think a Debian box, um, and you want to run git.dockerdiet.io, um, if you'd like to be, and there's lots of other ways to install it, the documentation is very, very solid. Um, another way to do it is to git clone the primary repo and just do a vagrant up if you're running vagrant on any of the major OSs that most people care about. Uh, and congratulations, you're running Docker. So another big question that seems to come up is, is it ready for production? And they say no. It seems like most of the reason no is about API volatility. So uh, put it in production as a function of your tolerance for potentially rewriting your code. Um, but we've definitely already started playing with it for things like test acceleration. Um, or uh, so because uh, it's a relatively easy thing to implement in the first place and it's rel it's very, very low risk if it stops working. Um, the actual first time I gave this presentation, uh, it was actually being served out of Docker itself in real time. So uh, this is just another quick Docker file example to say, show uh, copying the local talk directory that this, this GitHub repo has, uh, exposing port 8080 and uh, changing the work dir command is sets the working directory for the process that you're running. Uh, change over to the work dir and run Python 3 with the HTTP server module, and there you go. Um, so finish up with some linkage. I'm on Twitter at Jay Barrett. Uh, you can see the source for this and the vagrant files and um, all of the example Docker files and so forth and so on in the GitHub repo, Jay Barrett slash Docker talk. Um, Docker.io is a great website. It's very well made. A uh, lot of awesome resources there. And one thing that isn't super obvious when you drop on the website, but they have a really great Docker weekly email. So if you're interested in the project and want to keep up with it, it's probably the best way to find out um, what's going on week to week. And they ship links to really other good presentations and documentation and uh, new projects. So check that out. And thank you for your time.